Welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. Hi, I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. We're here to make a difference in how people look at conflict and to empower them so that they can actually do something about conflict in healthy, mindful ways. And today I'm so excited to have with us Sean Gatlin from the Western Justice Center. Um, both Sean and the center have amazing backgrounds and uh, a world of experience, a wealth of experience when it comes to managing conflict. Um, the Western Justice Center was actually founded by the Honorable uh, Retired Judge Dorothy Nelson, what they call the RBG of the Los Angeles Courts. And um, uh, it's really become a movement in how uh, communities and schools deal with conflict. We certainly know our communities and our schools have been riddled with um, deadly conflict uh, in, the, in the last number of years. And the Western Justice Center and Sean are out to make a difference. Sean herself has an extensive background working with youth through a number of her different professional careers, starting off with the YMCA. And now she's been with the Western Justice Center since um, 2020, uh, a time of difficult movement uh, in the uh, during the pandemic uh, era. Uh, but what they do is that they focus on bringing conflict resolution strategies into educational settings, not just teaching the students peer mediation and restorative practices, but also for the administrators of the educators uh, and the, the staff in schools, truly making a difference. Uh, they primarily work in the greater Los Angeles area, but are willing and able to go elsewhere. And so, uh, Stay tuned. You've got to listen, hear what's happening in our schools today. Uh, we truly can make a difference. She talks about the school to prison pipeline. Hmm, what's that about? She also gives us an elaboration of what restorative justice is all about. Uh, rather than punitive, actually restoring um, healthy living and relationships. So come join us. Another look at Decoding the Conflict Mindset. Again, Pass it on, invite friends, invite colleagues, uh, share it with your schools that you know in your community and learn what we can do about bringing our students up with skills and imagine what a different world this would be if our adults all had better conflict management skills. So again, don't go away, stay tuned. We're gonna be starting very soon. Well, here we are. Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the host and the Mindset Doc. We're here today to explore our troubled world in schools and what's happening. And uh, so with that today, I have um, Sean Gatlin from the Western Justice Center. Thank you, Sean, so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to have you here because, you know, what's going on in our schools is a hot topic these days and uh, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And so um, uh, I know that I was first affiliated with Western Justice Center through Kids Managing Conflict, a program that grew out of the Southern California Mediation Association where I'm on the board of directors and uh, was fascinated about Wow, well, you know, what can we do to enhance people's skills? Um, being a, a professional mediator myself, um, it's like, wow, you know, it's like, what, imagine what the world would be like if we just teach conflict resolution skills earlier. And that's what you're doing. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we provide skills, techniques, and tools um, with, for students and educators who um, want to um, do and live in restorative practices and peer mediation. Uh, we wanna put students in the driver's seat. Um, they make decisions. They are in charge of the way that they deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that is you know, a huge proponent of the Western Justice Center is to provide students and educators with the skills and tools in order to um, uh, live a pretty you know, healthy, um, uh, ex, you know, life, confident mm -hmm. life for the most part moving forward as we move, you know, as our students move and become adults, um, we hope to change. Uh, it's a movement really to really yeah. kind of change the, uh, the, the way that we think and feel and um, it, regarding conflict. 
you know, that's a, a really important point because I think many, many people are simply fearful of conflict. That's something to be avoided. And the reality is conflict can actually generate some really great new options, uh, new possibilities, and actually strengthen relationships if it's managed properly. Absolutely. One of the core um, components is that we want people to get comfortable with being uncomfortable um, and really look at conflict as an opportunity. Um, exactly what you said to um, maybe get some real understanding around, um, you know, some a disagreement, um, getting people to move forward um, and not be stuck or at an impasse. Yeah. So yeah, th those things are, those kinds of skills are uh, vital to um, all of us, um, really. Um, and and if every Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and at any age in life. A absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right. We're so much more benefit. Uh, we are so much more well-rounded as adults when we have skills and tools like, like conflict resolution skills. A absolutely. I'm curious, um, you know, uh, what is the what is the origins of the Western Justice Center and, and how did you get involved? So two questions there. Yeah, so yeah, sure. Um, so um, the Western Justice Center was founded in 1987 by our um, our leader. We call her the RBG of the Ninth Circuit, uh, <laughs> uh, the Honorable Judge uh, Dorothy Nelson, um, and herself, along with some civic leaders, some lawyers, and some um, community leaders, wanted to provide um, opportunities for the community that was outside of the realm of legal. Uh, okay. uh, um, thinking of people being able to come out of the courts and be able to communicate and mediate and resolve their conflicts within the community themselves, along with trained mediators. Um, so if we fast forward to today, 2023, mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a kind of a progression um, not only are we including the community at large, but we also want to um, uh, keep in mind the benefits of conflict resolution education in the school setting and shifting the culture on a school environment. Um, and that kind of brings us to where we are today. We're doing um, extensive work in the greater Los Angeles area um, with conflict resolution education, training and facilitation. And I got involved, um, the Western Justice Center, um, uh, since they've been around, I started, I wanna say maybe 2010, but with another organization. So in this field of peer mediation and restorative work. Um, and then I was, um, had a conversation with my executive director, Elisa Barrett, and she was very convincing. Um, and she, <laughs> <laughs> she was able to come on um, over. <laughs> yeah, come on over. So January 2020 is when I started um, with the Western Justice Center. So and I've been there for three years and it's been really exciting and quite a journey. Wow, that's fascinating. You know, um, I, I, I think it's so um Impressive, I guess, you know, with the Honorable uh, Retired Judge Dorothy Nelson, you know, being in, in the courtroom uh, and yet with the mindset, you know, an emphasis on, uh, you know, bringing conflict resolution outside of the courtroom and into the community. And um, because so many conflicts um, don't really belong in the courtroom, and yet many people feel they've got to rush to an attorney. And again, nothing nothing wrong with the attorneys, uh, but um, being, uh, you know, feel that they have to get legal representation before they um, actually, you know, deal with their conflict. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I... I when we talk about the um, school system, you know, you talk about the, the students, the educators, the, the schools, and of course, the community partners. Um, I know you've done some fascinating work in the greater Los Angeles area. And, and I remember when I first was introduced to the Western Justice Center, um, uh, a marvelous expose of um, what's happening in Pasadena, I believe it was. And um, the, the videos, you know, presented just were so... Uh, brought tears to my eyes, I have to admit, as far as seeing kids, you know, take charge of, of um, managing conflict and being successful at it and feeling the the rewards of being able to navigate um, through conflict. So tell us a little bit more about um, that particular project, just to give our listeners uh, an idea of what goes on. 
Sure. So um, we do what we call direct service training. Um, once students are selected and recruited to become peer mediators. Okay. Um, and so our training is um, pretty extensive. It kind of um, uh, matches what adult mediators are doing in basic okay. and advanced mediation. Okay. Um, so skills like active listening, skills like communicating without judgment, um, skills as in, um, you know, being able to uh, brainstorm what solutions are. So these are the exact skills that we are training our students um, as mediators. Um, and it is a sometimes a wonderful surprise when you hear the language being um, said back to you, when they understand what an emotional trigger is and how that plays a part in their lives, um, how they can learn how to put into place um, more proactive techniques um, mm -hmm. that help them along those triggers, because that's all a part of conflict resolution. We start with ourselves, right, being able to understand our own conflict, how we deal with it, looking at it as an opportunity, and then being able to take some act, some action in um, our own lives as we, um, I guess you can say, as we um, move around um, amongst people and school communities, right? So the, I really feel that we are trying to change the playing field um, and give um, students real um, a start to understanding conflict. So just imagine if uh, a full adult who has gone through mediation training, conflict resolution education, um, and is a, a teacher now, right? Giving back to uh, that community um, and how full circle that is that um, we're changing and, and, and populating um, people with um, these skills and tools. I hope I answered that properly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it's um, incredibly empowering. And, um, and as you said, you know, you, you can actually see the, the skill set um, demonstrated. You can see yes. the mindset um, uh, evident in how they uh, are communicating and they're truly making a difference. And when they understand that, that they are truly making a difference, um, I think it just propels them to want yeah. to do more and to be more, um, you know, involved um, and really um, become, when I say becoming leaders on their campus, they begin to change they begin to speak up for themselves. You know, they begin to um, uh, want to do more on their school campus. And it kind of all starts with um, their own knowledge around conflict. Well, um, well, I'm curious, you know, and I mean, certainly we, we know some of the challenges being faced in schools in terms of, you know, I don't really want to even get into the mass shootings and things like that. But, you know, what are some of the con kinds of conflicts that tend to arise um, where these skills become so important? So a lot of things, and I'll just kind of focus on one of the main things is social media. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff that happens on social media that tends to come off of social media and into the school uh, um, environment, right? So mm -hmm. there could have been some gossip there could have been some rumors. There could have been, you know, someone creating some kind of um, a list of, you know, you know, kids that they're kind of targeting. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they don't really address it on social media. But then at the school, when they come back to the school, either the next day or from over the weekend, there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of conflict mm -hmm. to kind of um, that starts heating up. Um, so that's one of the biggest issues is that we are dealing with. Um, so we already know that those kinds of conflicts can happen, but being able to have skills and tools when you do come back to school to deal with those conflicts um, is vital, very okay. vital. Um, and not only that, it's not just the administration that they're dealing with, mm -hmm. um, they are dealing with their peers, right? Yeah. So their peers are helping them resolve all of this conflict with each other, which 
There is a foundation of trust that happens amongst them. Mm -hmm. There are um, skills and tools that the people involved in the conflict take away from the mediation process. Um, So there's a lot of value in um, the process. Um, Sometimes things can um, escalate to um, physical altercations, not too many, um, Mm -hmm. but there are some times where it can escalate. Um, But what we try to do and what we try to um, uh, express is that if we get it in the beginning, Mm -hmm. um, handle it early on, then it does, it won't escalate to something larger um, where, you know, it's affecting the entire school campus. You know, that's a really important point. Um, you know, uh, I know I, I certainly emphasize this with the adults that I work with around conflict management, conflict management strategies, um, but how important it is um, to intercede, intervene, do something early on, um, because when it's small, it's much easier to resolve. When it grows and festers and escalates, then it becomes much more difficult and to to redirect and as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, such a you know large number of people can be impacted by a growing conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, you mentioned earlier um, peer mediation and restorative practices, and I, I, I would like you to amplify a little bit more, particularly around the restorative practices. I don't think a lot of people may necessarily be familiar with that term. Um, and and so, how does that work? And and uh, and then two. Um, I know that there's a lot of linkage from school to prison pipelines. So again, two questions there. Sure. So um, so what our traditional approach to Mm -hmm. um, disciplinary behavior, right, is usually punitive, right? Mm -hmm. So expulsion, suspension, you're called into the dean's office, um, you're talked to, there's some kind of punishment on the, on that, on after that, right? So um, if we want to make the shift, to mm-hmm. from punitive to restorative, there's mm-hmm. an opportunity to restore what was harmed. So for okay. instance, if there's two students that got into an altercation with each other, um, there's an opportunity to restore mm-hmm. where there is a resolution somewhere that happens. Um, and both parties are winners for the most mm-hmm. part, if I can say that, right? So making that shift to where Someone doesn't feel bad. Someone isn't punished. Are there consequences to certain, you know, kinds of conflict? Mm -hmm. Yes. But even with those consequences, we're still able to provide a more restorative approach, giving them the opportunity. Hey, we know we understand this happened, Mm -hmm. although you know what could possibly happen. But here's an alternative. Here's Mm -hmm. an alternative for you to try peer mediation with students of your own that are your peers that will help you resolve this conflict. That's more of the restorative approach, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Give your, and you're given the opportunity. You don't necessarily have to, it is voluntary. Um, so that is that you are included in that process. That's also the, a restorative piece. From a, a punitive repro- approach, you have no decisions. Someone is making decisions for you mm-hmm. and you're not necessarily um, involved in what the outcome is. And so at, from a perspective of restorative, you're involved. Um, you are the decision maker in how this turns out. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it can be easy. So it turns out to be that everybody can win well, um, in the end. You know, again, what I'm hearing and all that, how empowering that is, how how much, uh, what a confidence builder that is, you know, certainly self-esteem, you know, in terms of you know, being proud that, hey, I think I've resolved this, you know, uh, rather than feeling punished, you know, like you said, with a punitive approach, because that just drags us down, you know, so, yeah, yeah. Um, on that line, you know, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit more than on that school to pipeline. Sure. Um, so school to prison happened, pipeline, I'm sorry. So in my experience, what has happened currently is that if there is a youth that is involved in a particular type of maybe like a major incident, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or several incidents um, occurring. Um, Usually talking again about that punitive approach, sometimes that punitive approach can have um, some traumatic experiences that come Mm -hmm. along with that, right? Which can propel a student to withdraw, which can propel a student to hang out with the wrong crowd, 
which can um, you know, cause a student to um, not wanna be a part of the school environment. So now they are on, on a path where they could end up getting into a lot of trouble, right? They are now maybe possibly, with some schools we have you know, school police on campus, their interaction with school police can be a common negative. So we're starting to see a pattern where kids who are in this, what we call a pipeline of consequences, mm -hmm. end up uh, in this trajectory of heading towards um, getting involved in criminal activity and can end up going to juvenile hall, mm -hmm. going to jail, and then eventually could be prison. And so our goal or our movement is to create a intervention early on. And it's um, ev hopefully it can be preventative even earlier, right? If schools adopt more restorative practices, they can get in the mix of that earlier so that we are breaking the school to prison pipeline. And that this pattern of leading school students down this path, um, we're changing and shifting the culture and the thought process around that. So being able to be involved, being able to um, make your own decisions early on, you know what, me realizing as a youth, I made a mistake, but these people have given me an opportunity to make some change within myself. So that's, that's a huge part of it. That is part of the culture that we're talking about, making this cognitive shift from punitive to restorative so that we are changing that prison, the school to prison pipeline early on. Well, yeah, I mean, totally uh, redirecting the, the trajectory that that uh, a life might take, you know, um, you know, even with adverse, you know, experiences in, in childhood or in their upbringing, but they can redirect that into a more positive um, uh, lifestyle. And, and just to kind of add our training also with adults, because that's really they, they need to be advocates in this process mm -hmm. as well. Right. So we want to shift their thought process from a traditional to a more restorative approach so that we're all in this together. Because if we're all in this together, I mean, we can move mountains, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the power of people, you know? <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I, do you have some specific uh, examples of, of schools that you've worked with about the changes that they've accomplished by embracing this, this shift in um, you know, from punitive to uh, uh, restorative? Absolutely. So one of our biggest um, pilot programs is uh, Azusa Unified School District in the city of Azusa. Um, they've actually, as a, an entire district, they are taking on this um, movement of, of making the move from a more a punitive approach to restorative. So um, all 11 schools are, um, I guess you can say we're all in, in a, we're all doing this work together. Mm -hmm. So we started three years ago with training um, some key um, stakeholders. Um, and now we are training teachers and educators from just about every school. Um, we're also in the process of training all of the um, middle schools and working towards training the high schools. So um, across the board, even from the um, superintendent's office, everyone is on board with this partnership, partnership with the Western Justice Center. So just to kind of say that this is in California, as far as I know, this is one of the first district-wide approaches hmm. to um, conflict resolution education across the board. Um, it's very difficult, and this is a long, you know, process moving people along mm -hmm. to really kind of um, uh, get into a place where everyone is on the same page. Um, and it's exciting. It's a, a lot of work at the same time, but I love seeing the students and the faculty embrace um, what is happening in Azusa. And they are 100% on board. Um, we got a huge shout out the other day from the superintendent himself. He attended a student um, advisory council meeting and the students basically said to him, um, this is probably one of the best programs we've ever had for mm -hmm. us as students. 
We want you to continue to have it here and because we need it very uh, desperately. Um, and so they are, they are loving it. They are loving being in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. um, and so we hope to continue um, on this um, path with Azusa. Um, our plan is to, um, you know, work very hard to um, assist and support and provide resources for them to continue this journey. Wow, wow. I'm curious, um, uh, what's the sort of timeline? You know, once uh, Western Justice Center gets involved with the school district or a school site, um, you know, what's the timeline that it takes to sort of turn things around? So I think if um, for like standard, it's usually kind of three to five years. Our MOUs are usually five years. Mm -hmm. um, what is a little unique about Azusa is that we started in the middle of a pandemic. So mm -hmm. we're a couple of years behind, but we're still, we're trying to catch up. But that's the usually three to five years. Um, yeah. You start to see programs kind of spring up. Kids get really into it, usually the third year. And by the fifth year, things are kind of moving so we want to continue that sustainability mm -hmm. after the fifth year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's very consistent. That timeline is very consistent with what we expect for organizational change in any kind of setting. So it's not, not very different in the school setting then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, how can people support Western Justice Center if people want to get involved, and in, even if they're not in the greater Los Angeles area? Sure. Well, I'm always available. Um, they can reach out to me. Out to me. I'm the Western Justice Center um, Conflict Resolution Education Program Director, and my um, email is mm -hmm. sgatlin at westernjustice.org. You can also visit our website at www.westernjusticecenter.org. Um, we have um, lots of information on the website. Um, around, about our events. Um, we have an annual student-led event um, called our Peer Mediation Invitational that happens in February. Um, and we're excited that's gonna be coming up very soon. Um, and so we have many of opportunities for coaches and mediation mentors if anyone is interested in um, being part of our journey. Wonderful, wonderful. And so um, you said your, your annual February event is, is student driven then, is that what I heard? Yes, so we work alongside our some of our mediators who um, assist us in um, creating um, the peer mediation invitational. Um, what it, it's kind of become is like our peacemaker summit for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll have um, some workshops on mock mediations, we have a workshop from our students organizing, um, community organizing from the student level. Um, so we'll be talking about trauma-informed care and how that affects conflict with us. Um, and then we'll have a, a piece from our educators on, it's a community kind of dialogue with around best practices around implementing peer mediation programs in schools. Wow. So it sounds like a very informative yet hands-on kind of approach. Yes. And, uh, yeah. And I appreciate hearing, you know, when you talk about trauma-informed care, because we, you know, we now know and understand so much more about the, uh, you know, the, the range of traumas that people experience and what may be a trauma for one person may not be for another. And yet they're not major traumas necessarily, but they can be small, significant um, situations that have really impacted somebody's, um, you know, mental and behavioral health in ways that yes. are disruptive to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, well, that's right. absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I guess if you were to, um, you know, as far as the mission of Western Justice Center, if you could sum that up in just, you know, a few words, what would that be? Sure, so our mission is really to build the capacity of educators, students, admin, counselors, um, community partners, with the skill, skills and tools of conflict resolution education. We wanna be able to create uh, sustainable programs for mm -hmm. um, our partners. Um, and um, that's really it. So providing training, education, facilitation um, and conflict resolution is our goal and our mission. And um, we wanna build that capacity with them. 
Wonderful. Well, you know, I'm just thrilled that you were here today, Sean, with us and to, um, you know, speak to what's happening uh, at, at the educational level uh, for our younger students and um, really equipping them with the skills, the mindset, the ability to truly make a difference. You know, the power of the people, like you say, we can move mountains if we all come together. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Yep, yep. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm delighted that I've had a chance to get to know uh, you and your executive director, uh, Elisa Barrett, and uh, uh, keep up the wonderful work that you're doing and uh, look forward to seeing more about your annual event and uh, what's happening in the world of peer mediation and restorative justice. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dupree, for having me. And um It's been a wonderful uh, time having a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners and viewers um, uh, who tuned in for this very special episode on uh, conflict in our schools and what's happening with our students. And I encourage you to pass it on, share it with your educators, your administrators, your your students that you might have. Bring to their awareness that programs are happening and programs are out there that can truly make a difference in how our schools function in today's troubled world. And so uh, subscribe, be alerted to what's new, click the button below. And again, I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the host and uh, founder of Decoding the Conflict Mindset, making a difference in how we think. Well, thank you for listening to our podcast episode on conflict in schools and what the Western Justice Center is doing about it. You know, I I love what they had to say, what Sean Gatlin, our guest speaker, had to say as far as, you know, the power of people and we can move mountains and uh, and how to disrupt the school to prison pipeline uh, from punitive to restorative. And so, you know, it's just so exciting to see what, what people are doing out there and what you can do about it too. So reach out and support the Western Justice Center. My next guest speaker coming up in just two more weeks is um, going to take us back to the workplace. And she is the author of 48 Ways That Managers Abuse Their Power. With us, we have Hannah Hazel Keltner. And so she uh, has a number of accolades. So tune in, subscribe, be reminded of our next podcast. You won't want to miss this one uh, because she'll talk about the challenges of employee engagement in today's challenging world. Dr. Deborah Dupree, The Mindset Doc. Come back and join us and spread the word. Subscribe here and tell your friends and colleagues all about this.